Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archived classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Live from Super Soul Farm, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host, Raghunath, and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York, Kastuva Das. Welcome to the show, and welcome to Sleep in Sunday. Yes, you get to sleep into 8 a.m., you lucky ducks. Unless you're listening in California, then you're up bright and early. Welcome to the show. I appreciate you Californians for coming here. And of course, it's Q&A. Day. No, it's beyond Q&A day. It's very special <laughs> guest day today. It's guest interview day today. And we have His Holiness Hri Dayananda Maharaj Goswami. But Maharaj, don't say anything. we got a couple announcements first, and then we're going to bring you on. We're going to pick your transcendental brain. We're really eager for that. Kastuba. Yeah, I wanted to ask, first of all, the Bhakti Center is back open and a lot of our people in the New York area come to the Bhakti Center. They appreciated the Bhakti Center and then their hearts were a little bit broken during the pandemic. We were all isolated. We we're living on computers. We're losing our mind. We're talking to ourselves. We're walking <laughs> in circles. Help us. Is the Bhakti, the Bhakti Center is open and you had a wedding there yesterday? What's going on? Yeah, well, it is like, you know, the Thursday night kirtans are now people are coming back and they're starting to fill back up and events, you know, in, you know, in-person events are starting to open up again. So uh, it's nice. And yeah, there was a wedding, a wedding of uh, two Wisdom of the Sages listeners, Mina and Alex or Anupam. Uh, were married yesterday, and so I want to say congratulations to them. They're both very dear and sweet people, great, great people. And, and you know what? It was so nice yesterday because it was kind of, I don't know, like the first kind of big festive event that we've had that's it's been kind of open, you know, and everyone was kind of feeling it. Like Beautiful were their families kirtans. there? Was it like a, like a regular wedding? It was like a regular wedding. Their families, you know, what was so cool about their families being there is like um, both families were so appreciative of the Bhakti Center and of like Bhakti in general that their kids were into. You know, it used to be like, oh no, my kids are into like this horrible <laughs> cult. It's like, you know, but like <laughs> it was, it was like, you know, Amina's mother spoke, you know, publicly and she said to everyone, she said, since my daughter has been coming here, you know, I've never seen her, you know, so much at peace and so happy. And I just want to thank your entire community for welcoming her into this community. And, uh, and, and, and uh, Alex's mother, she was too much. Like she was like she was just breaking down left and right, you know, just crying and happy and, and just like she's saying, It's so beautiful here. You people are all so good and so loving and when you do that kirtan, I can just feel all the love that everybody <laughs> has for God and for each other. And it's a new like generation <laughs> of parents. Yeah, yeah. It was really sweet. But you know, uh Janavi led a beautiful kirtan, Jai Jagannath led a beautiful kirtan. Vasudev you know, who we've got to get on the show someday too, you know, was the, was the priest and he just did a fantastic job of translating the entire experience for everyone. And, uh, people were just really happy, happy dancing and singing and just happy. And it was, a, it was a wonderful event. So it's, congratulations again to the two of them. It's and, a new generations uh, of parents. It's a new generations of priests. Everybody yeah. likes the priests. At the <laughs> <Like Center. laughs> yeah, right. Oh, that's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. It was great. Because our, our, our parents weren't as thrilled. Mm, probably not. Our parents weren't kicking their heels together, crying at our, <laughs> my parents, I think my family begrudgingly went to my wedding right. in the Laguna temple. They were just like, all right, we'll do it. That's our obligation. <laughs> I'll wear the flower garland. Okay. That's enough. I'm not putting on the tea lock. <laughs> it's a new generation. Yeah. It's amazing. So it was great. 
I think uh, we also need to mention Lauren Baptiste is doing an Ayurveda thing. Uh, is that right, Mira? Is that right? Today? Yeah, that's right. Right after the show at 9.30 a.m. And, you know, Ayurveda for summer workshop. For summer. So you can just adjust your diet, adjust whatever you need to adjust for the summer. Yeah, you know, we're going to have to do something. You know, we had a little pre, we always have a pre meeting with our special guest before the show. And our special guest, Rita Nanamaraj, is a Sanskrit PhD from Harvard University. And I said, Maharaj, what does Mara's name mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we might have to, we uh, it, it came out, like, some things just don't translate well. The other way, also. <laughs> the other way. Mara. Mara's name anyway. can mean anything you want. It can mean death and pestilence, or it can mean the goddess of love. It could mean the goddess. <laughs> I guess it just depends on her mood. It depends on what it We're just going to call you pestilence today. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> because isn't Amara a name for Vishnu? It means deathless, right? Deathless. Beyond death, yeah. Amara. Amara. Or like Amrita. Call you like Amara. Amrit. Amrit. But maybe I could read uh, Maharaj's uh, bio and we can bring him on. Is that all right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So We are so eager. This is a very distinguished guest. Sri Dhananda Das Goswami first discovered Bhakti Yoga in 1969 at a lecture given by Srila Prabhupada at the University of California, Berkeley. Later as a disciple of Srila Prabhupada, he served as an early pioneer of Bhakti Yoga in the Western world, particularly in Latin America, where he opened dozens of centers in over a dozen countries and organized the leading publishing house of Indian spiritual literature in Spanish and Portuguese. Upon the passing away of Srila Prabhupada, together with the team that he formed, he completed Srila Prabhupada's epic translation and commentary on the Srimad Bhagavatam, which we read here every day on Wisdom of the Sages. Hridayananda Das Goswami received his PhD in Sanskrit and Indian studies from Harvard University. Having published articles with Harvard University Press, University of California Press, and Columbia University Press. He recently published his dissertation as the 91st volume of the prestigious Harvard Oriental Series. Well, he has taught at the Graduate Theological Union and at the University of Florida and has lectured at universities around the world. He is the author of the books Quest for Justice, Select Tales with Modern Illuminations from Mahabharata, as well as a comprehensive guide to Bhagavad Gita with little translation. And his latest book, which we want to discuss today as well, is a novel entitled Justin Davis. And and beyond that, he is currently working on a trilogy of the Mahabharata, which is uh, we're all eagerly awaiting. Welcome to the show, Hridayananda Das Goswami. Welcome to the show, Marash. Thank you. I've really done nothing with my life. (laughs) I know. I feel really. I was like, what am I doing with my life? (laughs) Didn't even go to college. That is quite impressive, Maharaj. We're excited. You know, we always, um, you know, obviously we go through the Bhagavatam every day and we're always picking out Sanskrit words. I wish I had a Sanskrit scholar here. So I think you're sort of an answer to our prayers. Would you like to share some of your appreciation for the Bhagavatam? You had a team that after, so Prabhupada translated just for our audience, the whole, uh, from the first canto and then in the 10th canto, he left his body. And so Hri Dayananda Maharaj and a, um, a team of Sanskrit scholars finished the translation and the purports. Do you want to share something, uh, an appreciation for the Bhagavatam for all of us to inspire us to dive deeper into it? Thank you. Thank you for all the, uh, the nice introduction. I, you almost convinced me that I'm an important person. So, <laughs> um, the Bhagavatam was really my first love, I would say. I mean, I, I mean, I joined, I joined the Hare Krishna movement in 1969 in Berkeley, and uh, I discovered the Bhagavatam. At that point, we just had the th- three volumes of the first canto that had been printed in India that Prabhupada brought with him. In fact, once he told me when he, he when he came to America as he was getting off the boat in the Boston Harbor that his confidence was what gave him. Uh, the conviction that maybe he could do something was that he brought the Bhagavatam with him. So the Bhagavatam is sort of the heart of Bhakti Yoga and has been for millennia. It's uh, from the material point of view, it's in a genre called Purana, which in Sanskrit means ancient. And for the linguists among you, uh, from the word Pura, before previous actually cognate with related to the English word previous and former words like that. So 
um, it, it, it tells ancient stories. And, uh, and also the Bhagavatam is distinguished. It's called the Amala Puranam or the, uh, the pure Purana because unlike other literatures, it sort of uncompromisingly gives pure spiritual knowledge and doesn't make a lot of concessions uh, to people in general or to generally the last thing in the world they want to hear is theology. So, so the Bhagavatam really lays it all out, but, but also it's a brilliant work. I remember actually one time before I, I went to Harvard as a student, I was invited when I was much younger to speak there. I was hosted by the same department where I later got my doctorate. And uh, the chairman of the department back then was a gentleman, really nice guy, very famous scholar named Gary Tubb. And um, so I was meeting with him in his office before I went to give my lecture. And he went on and on and on, you know, glorifying these literatures and, and so on. So there was another Harvard scholar, H.H. H. Ingalls, who in the 19th century, uh, 20th century, was sort of one of the most famous Western Sanskrit scholars. And he said of all the books he had read in all languages, Bhagavatam was the most impressive as literature. Hmm. So some of the features are that it's, uh, it has very, very advanced theology. Also, you know, simple wisdom, but very sophisticated theology. I mean, verses that you could really just think about for the rest of your life, just from the philosophical point of view. It's, um, it's, it's brilliantly composed. The composition is, is, is very beautiful poetry. It has varieties of meters, varieties of po poetic styles. And uh, it's sort of stories, sometimes well-known stories found in the other 17 major Puranas, literatures of the same genre, but it's, um, it's interlaced with this advanced theology. And it's uncompromising because as you know, if you, you know, if you, if you're a, if you want to go out and to use sort of a, a word that's not so popular anymore, if you want to go out and preach and, you know, no one wants to, it's like people say, we, don't, don't preach. We don't, we don't say that word. I know it's become a pejorative share. word. Share. Right? We share. I know that. I've it's also. The holy name. I've also made the curve and also don't use the word preach <laughs> in my, in my daily life. But, but the fact is let's say in neutral terms, if you're trying to share, if you're just trying to persuade somebody, <laughs> if you're trying to persuade somebody about ultimate spiritual truth, of course, we live in what is called the post-truth age. You know, the, uh, the um, what do you call it? Um, post-modern, post-sanity age. <laughs> in which there are alternative facts and, and even reality has been democratized. So that, um, which is an interesting conception. So that people will say things, which when I was growing up would kind of, if you said something, you know, they'd like, is that your truth? And so on the one hand, we certainly have our own mental truth. Like, like, you know, you have a unique first person experience of your own, of yourself, of, of the contents of your own mind, of what your thoughts and feelings are. So you have a unique experience of that, but in terms of, let's say, Boston is north of uh, Philadelphia. Uh, there really aren't any alternative geographic facts there. Or, for example, you know, basic mathematics. Or, I mean, there are areas in every science and in every academic field where it gets very sketchy, and it gets. It's really people are kind of giving quote unquote learned opinions. Mm. But in a post fact age, and, and even thousands of years ago. Even thousands of years ago, India had a very thriving intellectual culture. Uh, India, unlike other countries, not all of the countries, had intellectual freedom, religious freedom, there were a lot of very smart people. So it had this very flourishing intellectual, philosophical, theological marketplace, even thousands of years ago. And uh, so to try to convince somebody that this is the truth was, um, you know, it was a little daunting and even more so. And, he, and here was another point that, that made it difficult is that if it turns out, as we claim it does, if it turns out that the truth is spiritual and that the physical universe is just sort of like, uh, you know, the B list, it's like, like there's actually all of us are eternal. Being eternal is better than dying. And, uh, 
having full knowledge of, of the basic components of reality is better than ignorance. And being happy is better than being anxious and worried and sometimes depressed and sometimes having your heart broken. If you can find perfect love, that's better than, you know, failing in love. And so, and so you have this strong assertion in these literatures and actually you find the same strong assertion basically in all, almost all wisdom traditions in the earth uh, throughout history in all different cultures that there is a higher reality that, that the, the surface of reality that we are seeing in our daily life is just the surface and that you have to penetrate. In fact, the word superficial literally means on the surface from the Latin superficie. So, so when you're trying to convince people who are attached to material life, who are really into their bodies. You know, it's mirror, mirror on the wall. And um, so when people really are attached to being a dying body and they are attached to the idea that this is the real world, the physical world is the real world. And so on to, to sort of be a party pooper, to crash the party and say, well, wait a second, there's a higher reality. And if you really want to know that higher reality, you have to rethink your material attachments. That's not going to make you very popular in many circles. In mm. fact, it's going to be seen as sort of a, uh, a real nuisance, a pest. I mean, imagine if you're having a party and some preacher walks in and says, oh, don't mind me, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just thought maybe we could take an hour and I could, you know, preach to you. I mean, no. So, <laughs> so therefore, it's interesting for thousands of years, people who are trying to convey a spiritual message have tried to package it in a more attractive way. Like, no, I'm not trying to preach to you. I'm just trying to do this or no, this is not about transcending material life. It's really just about being happy and so on. And, and so even Vyasa, the great Vyasa, who is the, considered to be the author uh, of, of all these literatures, he's considered to be an avatar. And the word avatara, by the way, in case you're interested, ava in Sanskrit means downward and tara means crossing. So avatara literally means one who crosses down from the eternal realm down into this material realm. Hmm. And so uh, he wrote literatures in which he kind of, he became very indirect. Like he didn't want to lose his audience, didn't want to offend anyone, didn't want to drive people away. So he kind of stressed the material benefits of all this. Hmm. And, but at the end of all this work, he himself was unhappy. He was unsatisfied. So his guru came to him, his, one of the most famous gurus in the universe, Narada, Narada Muni. And um, he said, I think you're not happy because you're focusing on the external body and the material mind, and you haven't really gone deeply into the reality of the soul in your literatures. And so Vyas accepted this admonition from his guru and he sat down in meditation and said he went into Samadhi, which as you know, probably is the uh, highest point of yoga, complete concentration. He went into Samadhi, he actually realized because he was an avatar, he saw uh, Krishna or, or he saw God, he saw the material world sort of in its entirety, he saw its power of illusion. He saw the soul, and then he 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 composed a literature, which would not compromise, which would just tell the truth, no matter who liked it or who didn't like it. He would just tell the truth, and that literature is the Bhagavatam. Hmm. So, in that sense, the Bhagavatam can kind of clear up any uh, a debate about like what's most important in Vyasa's literature like some people may come away with one idea and some people may come away with another idea but the Bhagavatam was kind of meant to give the final word from the author himself yes and and even conceptually it does that because in the Bhagavatam you find a many you know throughout the Bhagavatam a learned rational consideration of other viewpoints mm. like maybe we should just try to enjoy our you know the material world and, and then it reasons its way. It's not dogma. It, 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 it reasons its way to the conclusion that your ultimate self-interest is spiritual. 
And uh, whereas the other literature don't do that, they're not rationally considering, let's say, Krishna or Krishna consciousness and then reasoning their way to some other conclusion that actually we should just really mm -hmm. totally get into our physical bodies. So the Bhagavatam is the literature that gives the whole picture, whereas the other literatures don't do that. Marsh, you know, it always interests me how uh, when you rub circles in, in these uh, academic fields with these acad what's the word academia um, acad <laughs> this is why you're not an egg academician egg <laughs> egg yeah. an egghead yes yeah. <laughs> smart people with the, with the, with so, do you mean smart people is that what you're saying <laughs> those eggheads at yale and harvard who are really into eastern thought and what do they th but they're not devotees but they they read it what do they get what what is their like do they does it does it hit them like it hits us do they change their life or do they just like fascinated with it what, what has been your um uh experience with these with these people who are diving deep and studying it they're scholars of the bhagavatam but they're not devotees i had a very positive experience at harvard mm. and uh i found that uh the faculty there they were very respectful of what i was doing and, and very curious. And so they started inviting me to speak on it. And they, when they published my talks and everything. And so, uh, because I was respectful of them. And um, so yeah, I had a very positive experience there. Hmm. And, and I think, you know, to get also at your question, um, spiritual consciousness is, is not merely intellectual. We cannot just by sheer intellectual prowess achieve high spiritual realizations there has to be actual devotion mm. and, and, and which is scientific it's interesting because if you contrast the devotional path with let's say the empirical path there is something actually clearly psychopathological about materialism which i'll explain and that is if philosophical materialism or as sometimes called now physicalism first of all to be a materialist has become intellectually, I think, discredited for the simple reason that in quantum mechanics, we no longer know what matter is. And people thought they knew what matter was, but when you look at quantum physics and you get down to the smallest particles, everyone's just scratching their head. And so to be a materialist, when we don't ultimately know what matter is, I think is really a uh, questionable position. But in any case, if, you're, if you have your faith in, let's say, empiricism or the controlled experiment, as a way of obtaining reliable knowledge about the world or about reality. The obvious problem is that you can only study things that you can control. Mm. And so to say that nothing is real or not where we cannot know that something is real unless we can't control it, to me is not a philosophy, it's more of an emotional problem. Mm. You know, someone that thinks that nothing is real unless I can control it. Mm. So, um, and of course, we all live in a bi-dimensional universe. If you believe, for example, in things like equality, equality has no empirical basis because let's say uh, to get on your show, I mean, you only invite certain people because you think that, you know, they're not gonna ruin your show. <laughs> I mean, I think that I'm flattered that you invited me on your show, but um, you need to get into a good university to win an Olympic medal to uh to become a great artist just to just to be a really nice person that people like as we know not everyone is a really nice person in their present incarnation <laughs> and so if, if we look at the real world we're not equal and yet in america and now all around the world people have decided to base their entire political moral cultural system on an assumption which is not empirical but actually it's metaphysical mm -hmm. because it's the, we're equal. We're, I mean, that's, it's right in the DOI, the declaration of independence that we hold these truths to be self-evident that we are created equal. So there's a metaphysical, there's a divine source of our equality, just like loving parents, see all their children equally. One kid is a genius. One kid, you know, is living at home at the age of 53. But the point is that the parents somehow find a way to love all their children. And so 
Our whole political system is based not on empirical evidence, but on a metaphysical assumption. Hmm. So if hmm. you believe there really is such a thing as justice, there really is such a thing as equality, you live in a bi-dimensional universe, which is both physical and metaphysical. Very interesting, Marsh. Um, you, you, you know, um, you mentioned, you were speaking about the composition of the Bhagavatam. And uh, of course, you know, it's written in Sanskrit. I just have two questions. And, and one is just like, you were describing how in one sense, the Bhagavatam is that book where it's it's most uncompromising and most pure and is kind of like the ultimate rev, you know revelation coming from Vyas. Is that reflected in the Sanskrit as well? Like is the Sanskrit and the, the you know the composition, the meters, the verses, the beauty of the poetry, is that also unique in Bhagavatam? And then my second question was like just could you tell us a bit about Sanskrit itself? Like what is so special about Sanskrit? Okay. First of all, the composition of the Bhagavatam is recognized even by, as we lovingly say, mundane scholars. <laughs> it, it is universally recognized to be a work of incredible genius, just in terms of the composition. It displays all kinds of uh, meters and styles, it, it, the vocabulary, the syntax. It's just, it's a work of literary genius. We often we often regret that we feel like we're just we're just like we read, you know. It's wonderful because we read Bhagavatam daily here on on the show, and there's so many people are new to it, and by hearing it daily, they're writing to us and saying it's changing my life, and so we 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 feel like okay, you know, we're 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 plugged in, we're connecting to this source, but at the same time, we realize that we're just like kind of scratching the surface of it on, in so many ways, and, and and there's so much we're missing. I'm sure you're getting the spiritual essence, but. Another interesting thing about the Bhagavatam, which I'll mention, please, that is uh, there's a, a, a biography, one of the most famous biographies of Lord Chaitanya called uh, Chaitanya Bhagavat, written about, oh, roughly maybe 450 years ago, or, you know, 470 years ago, whatever it is. And uh, in there, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we consider to be Krishna's avatar for this age, Chaitanya makes a very interesting statement. He says that just as the sun appears to rise and set in a particular location, uh, but actually the sun is always in the sky somewhere. So when the sun is setting, let's say where we are, it's actually rising somewhere else. It's midday somewhere else. So the sun doesn't really rise and set. It's just that our vantage point shifts. So he said in the same way, the Bhagavatam, like Krishna's avatars, the Bhagavatam is eternal, but it sort of rises, it manifests at a particular time on a particular planet in a certain historical period. And so um, if, you, if you study from a point of view of, let's just sort of academic historiography, uh, we know the Bhagavatam was composed at the time of Krishna, which according to archaeoastronomical references was over 5,000 years ago. And uh, so, but what we don't find, we don't continually trace the Bhagavatam from that point through history in the sense that other people quote it or refer to it, or there are carvings or this or that. It, it kind of reappears about maybe two and a half thousand years ago. And, and so, which is consistent with what Chaitanya says. Mm. And so therefore um, it's, uh, so at the time it manifests again, it's um anyway i forgot what i was going to say but it's uh but to repeat your question and you were saying that i was i was asking about if how the the sanskrit in the bhagavatam is it unique and oh, then right, you, right, right and then you mentioned the chaitanya bhagavad in the verse about the sun right uh so it's um yeah, so the Bhagavatam is kind of a, a literary wonder in, in, in terms of the way it's composed. Oh, I know, I remember now. Okay, uh, still have a few more lucid years. <laughs> that is, the Bhagavatam. The Bhagavatam is so sophisticated, and at the same time, very simple and, and totally open-hearted. But but the composition can be so sophisticated. The theology, the philosophy, can be so sophisticated. And, and, and it has all the signs of a unitary work. There was a text that's not corrupted. 
because Sanskrit texts have been coming down for thousands and thousands of years, there is a, an issue with text corruption. In fact, Madhvacharya, a great teacher about 800 years ago, wrote a book on Mahabharata saying that the text was corrupted all over the place because mm. it's a huge text and it's coming down for thousands of years. Bhagavatam, no. The Bhagavatam has all the signs of, of, a, of a unified text by one author. Wow. On. And yet it's so, so, if so, from the material point of view, from the, the point of view of material academic investigation, who wrote the Bhagavatam, they don't know. And so that itself is miraculous because I don't know of a single case in the history of the world where you get a text which is so incredibly sophisticated, so well composed, is so powerful of cultural influence. It just dominates an advanced civilization for, you know, for, mm. for so long. And yet no one has, from the point of view of material historiography, the slightest clue as to who wrote it. <laughs> and so in terms of, and that just doesn't happen. It's never happened. There's no book like that in any European language, which is comparable. And so to me, that confirms that it has a divine source that Krishna simply manifested it. It just- it, We call that a Krishna miracle around here, Maharaj. Yeah, we call that. <laughs> why isn't it more popular with the, why doesn't everybody know about the Bhagavatam? Uh, why doesn't everyone know about it? Um, we know about the Iliad and the Odyssey. We know about uh, the Canterbury Tales. Uh, well, because it, well, one one thing may be that we're living in the Western world. <laughs> you go to right, India, right. a lot more people know the Bhagavatam in India than than they know the Iliad and the Odyssey. Is that a tremendous influence on the Indian culture? Right? Like yeah. it's almost so, you can't conceive of how important it's been. I mean, India, India has been a, a center of world culture for a long time. Of course, you know, times change, India was invaded. It's called the Kali Yuga. It's a very difficult age. And, it, you know, the, the, the Muslims ruled India for over 700 years and did their best to destroy the local culture. And then, uh, you know, the British came and uh, kind of mocked them. <laughs> kind of mocked up. Well, it's it's amazing how between the Muslim invasions and the, there was different Muslim invasions, right? There was like Af Afghanistan invasions, Mughal invasions. Yeah, there was a, what's called the Delhi Sultanate, there, and and then the, the Mughals who were from Mongolia, really originally, they conquered uh, a Muslim kingdom in India. You know, Already so fighting among themselves, and they. Um, but but India. You know, it, it's funny, if you look at a world map, a flat, you know, flat map of the world, and you sort of block out the Western Hemisphere, uh, India is in the center of the world. And it's actually well known that... Um, I don't get that. If you Couldn't you turn the globe another way? No, no, if, if, you, if you look at a flat map of the world, and you just sort of don't look at the Western Hemisphere, which was it's kind of way out there. Compared okay. To the um, if you look at where, you know, the overwhelming majority of people in the world live, which is really one continuous landmass, which is Europe, Africa, and Asia. Mm. And so if you, if you look at that huge landmass that we call continents, it's really just one landmass, with all due respect to the Suez Canal. So then India is actually in the center. And it's well known that up to a few centuries ago, maybe four or five hundred years ago, India had practically half half of all the world's wealth, as it was calculated back then in terms of precious stones and minerals, agricultural production. I mean, the uh, the Roman Empire had a serious uh, trade deficit with India because India had so many things that the Roman Empire wanted and they had nothing that India wanted. So they had- they Spaghetti? Had to, <laughs> right. So they had to pay with gold. They had to pay with gold, and so there was. A, but it's um, another thing is we we have just throw in one more thing about ancient India. You're, uh, you're feeding Roganas Hindu pride right now. He loves this kind of stuff. He eats this stuff up, like spaghetti. So <laughs> I have Italian and Hindu pride. <laughs> uh, Hindu pride. I love. Yeah. Actually, when I went to Italy, I, I discovered that what I really love is New York Italian food. That's right. Not Italian. Italian. But of course, anyway, we're going to Italy soon. We'll find out for ourselves. There was a there was a Greek ambassador named Megasthenes about twenty three hundred years ago, 
who was an ambassador to uh, an empire in India, a dominant empire in India at the time called the, uh, oh my God, the, uh, the, the uh, Maurya, the Mauryan Empire, which was in the capital, of which was in a city called Pataliputra, which today is Patna, the capital of the city of Bihar. But anyway, he wrote a book about India, which was sort of a bestseller in the Greco-Roman world called Indica, about India. And he describes a civilization which is very, very advanced compared to others. For example, he says that in India, unlike the other places he knows, there's no slavery. Huh. In India, unlike other places he knows, is uh, unlike other places he knows, there is um, animal rights. There are animal rights. You know, there, there, there are so many vegetarians. There's freedom, absolute freedom of religion. Absolute freedom of religion. It's interesting because around the time of Megasthenes, even a slightly earlier, there was a great emperor, the first great Persian emperor called Cyrus the Great, who is considered a messiah in the Old Testament because he defeated Babylonia, freed the Jews from Babylonian captivity, let them go back to Israel and even gave them some donations to help rebuild their temple. Now, what's interesting here, is, and so Cyrus the Great is called a messiah in the Old Testament, and he was a boy. So anyway, he was a, so Cyrus the Great is a, um, but what's interesting about Cyrus the Great, who abolished slavery, he abolished slavery in, in his empire, he declared religious freedom all over his empire, and he spoke a dialect of Sanskrit. Hmm. Because ancient Persian is a Sanskrit dialect, and, um, his name in his own language is not Cyrus, it's actually Kuru. Ah, it's hmm. very ah. name Wait, for king. You said Persian, excuse me, Marish. You said Persian was a dialect of Sanskrit? Yes. It's called the Avestan language because <laughs> the literature of ancient Persian is the Avesta. So, um, so, for example, the god of the Zoroastrians, which was the Persian religion, is Ahura Mazda. But the word Ahura is actually the Sanskrit word Asura, but not Asura in the sense of a bad person. There, there are two, one, there's one word, Sanskrit word Asura, which is Asura, not a godly person, sort of an ungodly person, Asura. But there's another word Asura, which is a synonym of, uh, or Asu, which is a synonym of Prana the life air because like in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna uses the word asu. He says, Gatasunda Gatasu Cha Nanusanti Pandita, the wise don't lament for those whose life air is gone or for those whose life air is not gone. And of course, prana or asu comes to just mean life. It's life air or just life itself. And so the Persians pronounce an S like an H often. So Asura, meaning the God of life, the God who gives you the breath of life. Uh, became Ahura, and that the Ahura Mazda, the uh, the god of the Zoroastrians. We're learning so much today. Well, can you get that book? I want to get that book. <laughs> Mega, Me, Megasthenes, right? You can Google it, and you can find the text online. Yeah, M E G A S T H E N E S, Megasthenes. Mega um. Okay. Uh, did he become? A, is there like a pillar in India dedicated to him? That's the pillar of no. That was another Greek ambassador who became a Vaishnava, who became a devotee of Krishna. And then I don't know how his parents reacted, but so he built. Uh, I think it's called Helio, Heliodorus, the one who worships the sun. Heliodorus. Uh, he built uh, this large column dedicated to Vishnu. Mm, wow, he wasn't deprogrammed, was he? I don't think so. <laughs> And, you know, the actual history, for example, in India, you know, as, as you know, in the Bhagavad Center, there are deities, carved figures of Krishna. And uh, it's interesting that I think, I think there's good evidence that the idea in India of making sort of lifelike deities, not very impressionistic or, you know, but actually having very lifelike sculptures of the deity, I think there was a lot of Greek influence because the Greeks under Alexander, the conquered part of India, and they continued to have a kingdom in that area of especially Northwest, Bactria, modern Afghanistan, and everything. And many, it's interesting because many, some of the Greeks became Vaishnava, the devotees of Krishna. And then later, many of them became Buddhists. 
And so it said that the first lifelike statues of Buddha, not very kind of weird symbolic, but really lifelike human anatomy. Mm. First lifelike sculptures of Buddha actually were done by Greek Buddhists. And of course, the Greeks were the masters of sculpture, of lifelike sculpture. So there's a very interesting interaction between India and the West and all kinds of things going on. Okay, Stu, but do you mind if I just ask a question? I know we have a, we have a plan of questions, but because he's here and he's a scholar and a devotee, I'm really curious to know if um, a lot of the Greek uh, mythology did was that born out of the Puranas or the Indian mythology? Or devotees always say that, but was it actually? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, there. There are there are certain things that just uh, they're sort of they go beyond the history historiographic horizon we don't really know but i mean there are things which obviously make you think like um karna when he was born couldn't he put him in a little basket and set him down the river where he, where he discovered and you know moses same thing with moses and i mean if you look at flood stories like noah's flood and it's actually based on i, ju I just saw actually on youtube yesterday of watching this lecture given it at harvard at the Radcliffe Institute. And uh, it, it was a scholar from uh, Purdue who was talking about the origin of flood stories and how they actually have, in many cases, very reliable paleo hmm. uh, geologic information, like what really happened. And so you, you have these flood stories in the Bhagavatam, you have them in, in ancient Mesopotamia, then in the Old Testament. So the ancient world was much more in communication, much more in contact than we imagine. <laughs> Just to give one simple example that struck me, they found Viking graveyards outside Beijing. What? Yeah, and so, for example, from the word Arya, which in Sanskrit, I mean, Hitler kind of uh, really stigmatized that word. Yeah, he ruined but, it for everyone. Well, but the Sanskrit word Arya just means a cultured person, someone you know who's honest, who speaks properly, and so from the word Arya, of course, you have you find it in in, in, in the word Iran. Iran is is comes from Arya. You find it in the word Ireland, which means the land of Aryans. And so, so the ancient world actually people. You know, they weren't just, there were there were dark ages where people didn't communicate with each other and they were kind of locked into their own inbred culture. But if you look at farther back, the ancient world, people were, uh, I mean, ancient Greek, ancient Greek is extremely similar to Sanskrit. Really? And so, there, yeah, there's absolutely, I mean, not only like words sound the same, I'll just give you a few, but, but the very morphology, the structure of the language, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, a, a Sanskrit H tends to become a European G. So you take the Sanskrit word for vehicle, which is Vahana, Vahan, and it becomes German Wagen. Wagen. Yeah. Wagen. Exactly. I As love this Volkswagen. stuff. I know, you'd love like it too much, right? <laughs> like or a Volkswagen. <laughs> another example of, of What's what's what in German they call loud gazettes and sound laws a Sanskrit H become in European G, you have the, the Sanskrit word aham, I, like aham brahmasmi or soham and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so if you change the H to a G from a hum, you get the Greek eagle. There you go. Uh -huh. so that's where the word eagle comes from. Or for example, the Sanskrit word maha, maha, which means great. Like Maha Prasad, you know, great person. So from the word Maha, you change A to G, you get Magna, like the Magna Carta, the magnifying, magnificent. And even the, there's a Sanskrit word Huta, which means invoke, like when you invoke the deity. And uh, from the Sanskrit Huta, you change the A to a G, you get, actually my, my professor at Harvard mentioned this one day, that if you change the A to a G, you get the German Gott from Hut, and, and then you get the English word God. Okay, now Maharaj, I want to plug one of your books, yeah. and and that is your comprehensive guide to the Bhagavad Gita, which I found is just be such an excellent. Um, it's a thematic approach to the Gita. You you break it down into different themes, yeah. uh, as well as provide a translation. But it's really done so well, and it's really done you know with such great references to the Sanskrit verses. I found it very helpful, and my question to you is. 
through that um, guide, are there any, like, let's say, commonly held misconceptions about Vedanta or, you know, about yoga or Eastern spirituality that, that are countered by the Bhagavad Gita that you hmm. highlight in this guide? Good question. Uh, one thing I discovered as I was doing all my research for this book and which really is that really it's kind of like the central one central theme of the Gita is, is uh, we'll pronounce it phonetically yajna. And there's all kinds of regional Indian pronunciations like yajna, yajna, and this and that, but you know, the Sanskrit word yajna, which means an offering. And so the basic activity of a civilized human being or the basic activity of a divine human being is giving to others, hmm. is, is, is offering. And, and Krishna describes this cosmic reciprocity, which literally makes the world go round, that we're receiving all these gifts, and uh, such as you know the rain. If it doesn't rain, you can't eat plastic and you can't eat stone. So if it, if, if it doesn't rain, basically everyone starves to death. And so that rain is coming not only from above, you know, in the sense of the sky, but it, it, it's a gift. And, and so when you receive a gift, if you're civilized, you offer back, mm. you reciprocate. Mm. So if you think about it in a relationship, in a successful romantic relationship, it goes bad if there's not reciprocity. If you are giving, there's one great song, probably in the 60s, uh, uh, that when you just, it begins, when you just give love and never get love, you better let love depart. And so it's, um, so that's the idea, reciprocity. Friendship is based on that. Loving relationships are based on that. The legal system is based on that. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's the foundation of civilization itself. I think when, when people hear the word sacrifice in relation to like a religious literature, yeah. We maybe we picture some kind of primitive you lamb, know, yeah, either like that, like the killing of animals, or like some kind of maybe primitive worship form from some backwards kind of people, or well, something actually, like that. First of all, fire it is a unique element in that I mean, it consumes other elements in a way that you know, water can dissolve them and, and air, but water, fire was considered to be the special mystical element. And but even in the Bhagavad Gita, even 5,000 years ago. If you look at chapter um, chapter four or five, where and I explain all this in the book, that Krishna has already taken, let's say, the paradigmatic fire sacrifice, which was done all over the ancient Fourth world. Fourth chapter, yeah. You find it in the Iliad and the Odyssey. You find it everywhere. I mean, everyone in the world used to fire sacrifices, and the idea being huh. that, that, that the fire, it, you know, transports your offering to a higher realm. But even in five thousand years ago in the Gita. Krishna is talking about sacrifice as the actual physical fire is just one way to do it. But you can do it symbolically. For example, the fire can be your mind. And, mm -hmm. and what you offer to a purified mind is all your thoughts so that your thoughts become an offering or, or, or your sense perception, you know, flavors and, and, and tactile sensation and sounds and sights and you offer them you offer them in, and, and the senses become the fire. So there's all kinds of ways that you can symbolize the act of sacrifice so that it becomes a yoga process. In fact, when you're meditating, if you really understand yoga, with, which about seven people do, if you really understand yoga, then what you're actually doing is you're, you're offering your own experiences, your sense perceptions, the activities of your mind, you're offering them into the fire of devotion. And they're being transported. So, so the idea of devotion, ultimately, spiritual life is about devotion. You can't even sustain a relationship with another human being, let's say a relationship which is not sick, which is healthy. You can't even sustain a human relationship unless you know how to reciprocate. Mm. If you go into a store and put, you know, put in, put, you know, take everything you like and walk out without pain, you'll go to jail. You, you can't do, you, you can't even feed yourself without reciprocating. You can't have relationships without you can't have you can't have law and order. You can't have civilization. You certainly can't have enlightenment. Hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So reciprocity is really what makes the world go round. Mm -hmm. so therefore, ultimately, spiritual life must be about devotion because we've received the gift of life, consciousness, love, and, and, and nature. And so spiritual life really begins when one begins to reciprocate with all the, for all that's being given to us. But Maharaj, isn't it commonly held, many people that are coming from, you know, like a tradition of Vedanta, they'll see that ultimately we're all, they'll, they'll say, they'll interpret these texts as that ultimately we're all one in the end. Oh, no. That, first of all, that's horrible philosophy. I mean, I don't mean it's bad religion. I just mean it's, ba I mean it's bad philosophy. Okay. Because, because first of all, I mean, you know, I, I like you, you've known you for a long time, always thought you were a really good guy, but you know, I want <laughs> Do I want to merge into you? No, that would be like my worst sci-fi nightmare. Yeah. I mean, imagine if, I mean, I don't want to be an eternal blob. I don't want to be, I love being a person, an individual and, and being able to love and be loved. You know, I like, I play music. I mean, you know, that's what I do to forget that I'm a leader in a religious institution is that I, um, you know, I, I compose music you know, on keyboard, neo-baroque music. And I, I mean, I love being a person. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to sign up for giving up what's most valuable to me, being a unique individual person. And every one of you is a unique, beautiful, individual person. There's no one else anywhere in, in, in the kingdom of God that's exactly like you. Okay, now that's perssuasive. But um, from from but how does Krishna address that in the Gita? How does oh, the Bhagavad Gita? And, and by the way, that's not even what Vedanta says, because even... Western academics who are not, don't believe in any of this stuff, they say that the impersonal interpretation of Vedanta is actually, it's a forced interpretation. That's not what's really in, in the word. Huh. I didn't know that. Yeah. In, in, the academics in, say that. Oh, yes. In, Shankara, who's like the, you know, like Mr. Impersonalism, they even say that, and this is Western <laughs> academics, they just say objectively, Shankar is forcing his own views on the text. But those, that's not really what the text You're is. You're saying objectively, if one looks at it, one, one can see that. Yeah, if you just look at the sample words. Right. Now, do, why would, act, what do, act, I mean, we all know that Shankar was a great academic as well. So fact, actually, what do, he was a great thinker, but he wasn't a great, uh, what's the word, um, philologist. In other words, back in those days, he, he wasn't like looking at the Sanskrit words and, you know, what does this really mean? Like, for example, I just picked up one thing. I, I just opened one, a book when I was at Harvard. It was his commentary in one of the Upanishads. And so there was a word. And so his big thing is everything is knowledge. Like, because ultimately within personalism, you don't, you don't want to do anything. You just want to know. You want to, you know, cognize or something. And so so, he, so there, the word tapas comes up. It's, the word tapas in Sanskrit comes from the root tap, which means to heat or to burn. And therefore, tapasya, austerity, penance, it means you kind of like, because India is a hot country, and so most of it. And so therefore, they associate you know, misery with heat. And so, so the word for heating also means to do austerities, penances. And it's a very common word, and that's exactly what it means. And so Shankara looks at this word tapas in the Upanishads and says, well, it means beyond knowledge. No, it doesn't. No, he, he just takes words and invents new meanings for them. Or that famous thing, soham asmi. Or, or uh, tat tatmasi, we were discussing yeah. yesterday, yeah. Yeah, but that just means you are that, which the Bhagavatam also says, that means you are also spirit. You are also part of the ultimate truth. Right. It doesn't deny individuality. And do you find the Gita to be strong in this kind of uh, defending this perspective of, of our individuality? Oh, absolutely. It, it, it's overwhelmingly. I mean, Krishna says in the Gita, for example, I'm a Gita thumper. So Krishna <laughs> says in the Gita, you know, 647, that um, yogi nama pi sarvesham, indeed of all spiritual pr practitioners, Madgatena, the one, Antaratmana, the one who's literally inner self. Antar is like related to English word interior or inner. So Antaratma, your inner self, one whose inner self literally has gone to me. Shraddhavan, one who really 
He trusts me, believes in me. Budget age mom, one who worships me with, with, with faith and devotion. Same yukta tamo mataha. That person I consider to be the most yukta. Now the word yukta, which is a very important word in the Gita, is cognate with yoga. The word yoga, link, comes from the Sanskrit root yuj. And so if you want to say linked, like put an ed at the end of it, linked, mm -hmm. that in Sanskrit, the way you do that is you, you put a, a ta. So it's yukta. yukta. So if yoga means link, yukta means someone who is linked. Mm -hmm. So tama, in this case, is a Sanskrit suffix, which means superlative to the highest degree. So yukta tama means the most linked of all, in other words, of all linkers, the one who's the most linked is the one who loves me, the one who's devoted to me. Hmm. Krishna also says that those who are abhuti, abhuti means intelligence, those literally just, I mean, it's kind of in Sanskrit means like brainless. You know, those who just don't get it, they think, they think that I'm actually a vyakta, something impersonal and formless, but that apanam, I've taken on vyakti, a, a visible personal form. Mm. And Krishna says people who think that way are abhuti, they just no intelligence. <laughs> Well, you 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 highlight that, and and so many. Like I say, it's a it's a thematic approach, your guide to the Gita, that just takes you know quite a few subjects and and really very clearly highlights them. So I really thank you for that. Uh, Kostub, Kostub, yeah. are you are you wondering like when Maharaj said that uh, the Mahabharat has been adulterated, and Madhvacharya said it eight hundred years ago. What about the Gita? Has the Gita been adulterated? Good question. No. No, for the simple reason that the Gita it, it had two big advantages over the Mahabharata. Technically, it's inside of them. One is that the Mahabharata is like absurdly long. You know, it's like 100,000 verses. And the Gita is very short. And in ancient India, they had extraordinary powers of memorization. For example, the Rig Veda, which is made about, I forget the exact number, 18,000, about the size of the Bhagavatam. And I remember my professor at Harvard used to always say that it's like we have a tape recording. Of course, that, I'm dating myself, right? Tape recording. Yeah. <laughs> like we have, a, he used to say that we have a tape recording of, five, of you know thousands of years ago because, because in the Rig Veda, the power, this is very interesting. You have different classes of Sanskrit literature. So in the Upanishads, the more theological, philosophical literature, the powers and the ideas. In, in, in the Mahabharata or, or the Bhagavatam powers in the stories. And so, anyways, they memorized the Rig Veda because the power was actually in the physical sound. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was a famous case where uh, uh, someone was performing a sacrifice, Plushta, and he wanted, because Indra had killed his son, so he wanted to get, to get so like this monster who would kill Indra. So he was supposed to say, Indra Shatru that let this fire produce the mortal enemy of Indra, but he uh, kind of dropped the ball. And <laughs> I mean, a little he, mispronunciation, it really cost he him. Did is he just misplaced the accent. He said yeah. Indra Shatru, which means Indra will be the mortal enemy and kill this creature that I'm creating. So, so they memorized, they had extraordinary powers of memorization. Hmm. But in the and so the Gita was relatively easier. Yes, and to also, preserve. It was so important. Everyone recognized, wow, this is the book. So widely spread. And so therefore, there, there was, it was very easy to memorize yeah. people back then. Nice. And, it, and they had a huge vested interest in memorizing it, whereas the Mahabharata didn't have that same, to use kind of a funny academic word, salvific power. In other words, people didn't think that if you just read all these stories, you know, you'd be eternally liberated. So there wasn't that much at stake, and also it's much too big to, even for them to memorize. And and you know, once kind of the dam broke, it went all over the place. Mm -hmm. Like to right, give you right. just to give it one simple example of the Mahabharata. Uh, South India is what I call the buckle on the Bible on the buckle on the Veda belt. <laughs> okay. For the same reason of the American South, because if you look at the American South, it was relatively uh, isolated. It wasn't connected to Europe the same way the Northeast was. It wasn't connected to the West Coast the way you know Japan and China were. 
uh, it, it wasn't connected to Japan and China. So the coast, the, you know, the Northeast and, and, and the Pacific coast was really internationally connected. More diverse. And that's the, influences. Yes, the cosmopolitan view of things. The South was not connected, hot, agricultural. So you don't get so many cities. You don't get, you know. And so the same thing in, in India, you know, peninsular India, the South of India, it's hot, it's agricultural. They didn't have much contact with other cultures. And so it became very conservative. So in the North, which is much more cosmopolitan, you have this great sage Parashara meeting this very beautiful young lady, uh, Sajivati, and having a relation with her and begetting the avatar Vyasa. And so when people, when reciters were called suttas, when they went down to Southern India and told the story, it's like people were shocked. What? They weren't married? Hey, you know, an avatar is not going to be born out of wedlock in South India. So what they did was they kind of had this literary shotgun wedding. So, so if you look at the South Indian, if you look at the South Indian versions of Mahabharata, uh, there's this huge wedding and, and, and Parashara marries Satyavati. There's all kinds of things. Or let's say, for example, you were reciting Mahabharata and, and you live in Southeast India, where there was this... Uh, powerful dynasty, what does state Tamil Nadu? And the king is a fanatical worshiper of Shiva, not Krishna. So if you want to recite Mahabharata and his kingdom, we need a few chapters glorifying Shiva. Mm -hmm. mm. And so there are all kinds of socio-cultural, even military pressures, and the text went all over the place. And, and then it kind of got frozen about 2,000 years ago when people started writing. The, uh, the culture described in Mahabharata and Bhagavad is an oral culture. They don't write things, they just remember things. And so writing kind of freezes the text. Yeah, so, so it, becomes, it, comes, it becomes kind of a folk literature in the different regions of very India. Much. Yeah, very much. So, so we can look at you know, the different the texts of the Mahabharata in different regions, and it's obviously the same book, but it's, um, there are regional variations. Very interesting. Vedic uh, culture, I'm sorry, I'm, sorry I'm, I'm just so eager to pick your transcendental brain, Maharaj. So Vedic culture, how far would you say it extended outside of India if India was the hub? Well, Ireland, they found little, uh, what they call these um, Harappan seals. They, they had little pictures on seals, probably used for commerce, in what is today uh, Northwest India, Pakistan, even over in Afghanistan, the Harappan civilization, which goes back many, you know, before Krishna, it goes back before the time of Krishna. And uh, so they found some of these seals. They found one seal with Pashupati, Shiva, meditating in yoga position with the animals around him. That's a very popular form of Shiva, Pashupati, or the animals. And they found it in Denmark. So hmm. there, I mean, we know that right at the border of Europe in, in, in Turkey, there was a, a peace treaty signed between the Mitanni and the uh, Hittites. You know, honk if you love the Hittites. And um, <laughs> so they they signed a peace treaty about 4,000 years ago. And, and so, you know, to make sure no one cheats, they, they invoke as witnesses of their treaty all their different gods and goddesses. But the last eight names are right out of the Rig Veda. Huh. And it's interesting, and by adding the eight Vedic gods like Indra and so on, it brings the total number of celestial witnesses to 108. I mean, there's also, they found this ancient, many, many thousand years old, this ancient sort of manual for chariot racing. For what? Chariot racing. <laughs> chariot racing? Chariot racing. Ben Hur. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, and so they found, they found this also in, you know, near Europe and, and all the technical terms in this manual are Sanskrit. Huh. I mean, so plus, I mean, the linguistic evidence, the fact that ancient Greek, uh, Latin, and even Albanian, and all, all these, you know, all these ancient languages are very close to Sanskrit. So there's a culture area. These people obviously communicated with each other. Mm -hmm. Also, the Mahabharata mentions visitors from China. We know that uh, when Buddhism spread to uh, China, that uh, Chinese pilgrims used to come long, long ago. They used to come to India to visit all the holy places 
associated with the life of Buddha, such as Jaya and so on. So people are coming from Europe, people are coming from uh, China and probably Japan. So that's kind of like the known world. All right, Marsh, before we wrap up, we want to discuss a little bit about, you know, your your uh, new book, which is a novel, which I find, you know, I love that. I, you know, I, I'd like to see Bhakti enter more into the popular culture. Um, can you tell us a little bit about a, your novel, which is entitled Justin Davis? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I became convinced that a novel is, is a very powerful way to, uh, to teach people because... I was so inspired by novels at a certain point in my life, and uh, I just became a big fan of Jane Austen and other 19th century writers. And 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 I just found that you know I'm one of those people that's a you know Jane Austen fan. So I really um, <laughs> and so if you think if you think of a novel, it it has the power to really kind of engage you in life as a whole. I mean, you can I can write an essay, let's say, on philosophy or this or that. In a sort of the world of ideas, yeah. But we not only have a brain, we have a heart, we have relationships, and so I found that a novel has the power to sort of give you life as a whole, life it, the way it really occurs. Because if you think about how you live your life, like during the day, sometimes you have ideas, sometimes you have feelings, or ideas and feelings. You have relationships, you do things, and so a novel, I thought, kind of draws you into this very powerful replica of life. And you can communicate ideas and, and even moral principles in a very natural way. Like just to give one simple example, uh, in, in Jane Austen's most famous work, Pride and Prejudice, there's this dramatic moment where her youngest sister, who's a complete airhead, she, you know, she runs off with, uh, with, with Mr. Wickham. She elopes. I mean, and not married. So in those days, that was an absolute catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Actually, even when I was a young boy in the 50s. And so it's funny because people who, if they, if you just told them, like, you tried to give them a moral lesson, like, uh, you know, you should get married. If you want to have intimacy, you should get married. I mean, try telling anyone that nowadays and then you know, duck before they, before they punch you out. So, but it's funny because same people who, who, if you tried to tell them that, they would, they would, you know, they would go crazy, but they watch let's say a Pride and Prejudice movie and they really, oh my God, Lydia. Noble, yeah. Right. Yeah, and so, I don't know, somehow there's this power. Yeah. They say that about Uncle Tom's Cabin too, which was, you know, a book about slavery. That you, could, yeah. there's some, you could write so many texts about the Civil War, about slavery, but like that novel actually had like historic influence more so than anything that had been written before. Yeah, and, 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 th and then if you look at narration, it's like storytelling, because novel, a novel is a way of telling a story. And it changes over time. So there's a point that I, I, I've made a lot that um, even a pure text, let's say a text written by a pure soul, uh, is still historically situated. For example, if you look at Rupa Goswami about 500 years ago, who we accept as a pure soul who came to this world to teach about Krishna, personal student of Lord Chaitanya. And yet if you look at the way he wrote his books, it very much, very much reflects the contemporary standards of writing, what's good writing. If you look at his Sanskrit, he writes, because if you look at Sanskrit, different centuries, different millennia, you know, people just, they have different styles. And so he mastered the intellectual environment of his age and he produced these books, but they don't necessarily, to use the terrible cliche, they don't necessarily resonate with us. God, somehow that word has become, anyway, so it doesn't, because it's not the way we tell stories. It's like, for example, they did this movie, a few movies about Thor. I, I suppose you know that there were these Thor movies. Hey, Sherry, how are you doing? <laughs> so they, they, did the, they did these Thor movies. And believe me, believe me, if they just would have done a very strict, literal movie, a movie based on the ancient... Scandinavian mythology would not have sold tickets. It's you know it's basically a story. So you take the story, and, and we have certain ways of telling stories. There are certain things that move us nowadays. Mm. For example, we we're much more into psychology than people used to be. 
So if you look at, and, and, and so a novel, I think, is just a way of telling the story mm -hmm. a way that really reaches people nowadays. And so... And what is your novel about? Yeah, can you give us a little synopsis, but leave us hanging? Okay, yeah, I had, it's totally original, something no one ever thought of, boy meets girl. <laughs> just kidding. So, uh, okay, it's about this boy living in a very small town called Davis, West Virginia, which is a real town. It's actually the highest incorporated city in West Virginia. It's very tiny. It's like 400 people. There's a twin city, Thomas, next to it. And uh, I actually picked this because I was intrigued because Davis, pronounced just like that, means God in Sanskrit. And the town next to it, just a mile or two down the road, Thomas means ignorance. So I thought he was divine. And, but anyway, <laughs> somehow, so it, it takes place in these, in these little town, and um, he's from the richest town, a family in the town. In fact, the town is named after his family, his father's family. And their his father's a really good guy. He's actually a, he's actually a scholar, but he's very, very wealthy. And then what happens is, through all these, for these strange reasons, we find out more about later, uh, his, they lose their family fortune. And just at the time they've lost their fortune, his father is murdered. These are not really much spoilers. This happens this is the, sort of the beginning. And so suddenly this boy, who's Justin Davis, who ever since he was a little kid, he was like the prince of the town, good looking guy, really smart, martial arts person. Suddenly his family is humiliated. He loses his father. He's completely traumatized. And he just becomes, he completely withdraws from society. He just like, he hates the world. And he just sort of drops and he's, 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 he's about, 15 at the time, he just, and yep. he, he rejects the world. And then his mother, on his birthday, he refused to have a birthday party because they went from living in the biggest mansion in the town to literally living in a trailer, which they used to maintain just for like homeless people. They let homeless people stay there. And he so, you know, at an age when you're a teenager, everything is pure respect. I mean, it's sure. about having your peers accept you. And so he, he just basically rejects the world. Always angry, dresses in black. And uh, so he refused to have a birthday party because and he literally rather die than have other young people come to their trailer. It's so humiliating for him, he'd rather die. And so his mother gets him a gift and it's, it's his book called The First Avatar. And so he reads his book and then all kinds of things start to happen. And um, that's as much as I'll tell you. Sherry okay. made it. <laughs> but you can't. Well, do that uh, well you know, I, I, got, <laughs> I, I got this book. I got so drawn into it. And the father got murdered. And I mean, it, it, this was, Kostu, this was a book I was been looking for. I've been looking for a good murder book. Murder? That's yeah. Krishna conscious. <laughs> <laughs> Put them both together. You don't have to listen to those podcasts anymore. About murder. <laughs> Two Children great murderers to go and great stuff together. like that. <laughs> and I got really sucked into it. Justin Davis' father died, and then he's humiliated. You know, he's a, a kid who, like you said, grew up like a prince in this rural town, really respected, and then lost everything, has to live in the trailer. And then he had some metaphysical out-of-body experience, and then I lost the book. It's somewhere in this house, oh, no. and I'm driving me crazy. And now I'm Little on the Little Lieberman has a copy right there. Yeah, see, I know. Right? It's starting again. And so how can Let's we get, get this book? Because I'm sure all our readers, all our listeners want to read something um, this summer. Good where summer reading it? list. Yeah, maybe we, we should put like a link where they can find If you go to, can I put something in chat? You so, can, but again, most of our listeners aren't going to find it there. So, oh, oh. but uh, if we can I just tell them. People, if you go to H, as in hooray, H D. Goswami, G O S W A M I, hdgoswami.com. Mm -hmm. hdgoswami.com, got it. It's like I'm on TV, Did that's hdgoswami.com. But wait, <laughs> order one today and I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> we do that here. You know, we got to wrap it up because we got our Dr. Your Cover meeting coming up and our Ayurvedic thing coming up soon. Okay, hdgoswami.com, right. we can order it there. Really, uh, Maharaj, I could talk to you for hours. Maybe I'll call you on your downtime and bother you and pick your brain. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Everybody loved it. I've got I'm getting tons of feedback in. And um, it's been a great morning. What a great morning. Thank you. And good luck with all your further um, 
creations. You're Maha, you're working on a Mahabharat trilogy. We're all excited. I'm on the edge of my seat for this. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You all very much. This is where we get a little crazy, Maharaj. This is like the dance cam part of the show. We actually dance in front of our computers. It's quite silly and, and quite wonderful. <laughs> so I want to thank everybody for joining us. It's been an incredible day today. We're going to start back with Sweet Baby Krishna tomorrow. So um, be on the edge of your seats for Patreon members. This is a community-supported podcast. You like it? Throw some money down and keep this thing going. I appreciate it so much. And um, we're excited for our Italy retreat. I think it might be sold out. So you can check out with um, Vivi at W-O-S-D, Wisdom of the Sages. Did I spell that right? Wisdom of the Sages. W-O-T-S, Italy at gmail.com. Thank you, Mara. <laughs> and, um, yeah, if you're, uh, if you're interested in that, come join us. Thanks, everybody, for uh, being here. Justin Davis is the name of the book by H.D. Goswami or... Sri Dayananda Das Goswami. The website is, what's the website now? HDGoswami.com. Yeah, HD Goswami. Thank you for joining us, everybody. It's a beautiful day for a beautiful day. <laughs>